Quick warning, some of these stories contain sensitive content and as such, viewer discretion is highly advised. And, as always, if you have a story you want to send my way, go to asthereavendreams.com slash submit or check the links down below. And of course, thank you. A few years ago, I went to a party at a mutual friend's house. It was your average party. Lots of drinking, loud music, people passed out in random places and such. Most of the people there went to the same university, save for a few that were there because they knew someone else, such as myself. I wanted to get out of the state that I grew up in, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do post high school. So I just moved in with my friend and found a decent paying job until I figured my life out. And that friend invited me to join him at what was basically like a friendsgiving type of deal, but more alcohol, less turkey. I was just going to be by myself this year as my parents were going to Italy for their anniversary and I didn't want to waste a trip of coming home if they weren't going to be there. So, I figured why not? Free beer, free food, and free entertainment. It was pretty much as I expected. I didn't know too many people there, but I talked to a few people. My friend introduced me to some, and we all joked and hung around. After a while of BSing and getting a little buzzed, I went to find a restroom. On my way, I passed the front room, which had these huge bay windows in the front, and on the porch out front was a single person, sitting on the half wall, and it looked like she was reading. Who goes to a loud-ass party and tries to read? So, after stopping at the restroom and still seeing her out there, I decided to join her. Her name was Olivia, and she was, in fact, reading. She said she was dragged here by her friend to help her get her mind off of her recent breakup that she'd had, but she was also getting really into this book, so she brought it along. I used to read a lot in high school, and I was teased about it a lot, so I felt like I had something in common with her already. I didn't really have the time to read anymore, and I envied that she'd just found any time to do it at all. We started talking about books and she even suggested some audiobooks to check out. She showed me an app to use, and things like that. We talked for hours, it seemed, before we realized the house had gotten pretty quiet, and many of the people had left or passed out. She hadn't drank any, and my friends and I rode together, so seeing as how he was passed out somewhere, she offered to give me a ride home, and I accepted. I felt bad since it was around one in the morning and she was willing to take me home, so I offered to let her come in and I would make her some coffee or something. She declined though, saying that she had things to do early the next morning but would call, so she exchanged numbers and I headed to bed. That same day, it was probably around noon or so, I woke up to her calling, to my surprise. I'd only been in one previous semi-serious relationship, so I wasn't expecting her to actually call or be at all interested. Sure enough, though, she was calling to ask me to come to the door as she had brought us lunch. I thought it was a sweet gesture of her, and I was surprised that she remembered where I lived. While eating, we talked a bit more about ourselves, where we worked, where we were from, and just that sort of thing. She said she was attending the nearby uni as well, and was actually an intern nurse at a local clinic. I thought, great, she has her life planned out at least. Maybe it would do me some good getting to know someone like this. Of course, we quickly hit it off, and started dating. She'd stay over at my place a lot, and I would occasionally go to hers, but... She preferred staying at mine. 
I didn't really have a problem with it, as she would get up and leave at random times for work, so I didn't have to worry about rushing out of her place or anything. One thing that she really seemed to like to do was bring me gifts. I want to say she was buying them, but I wasn't always sure about that. Some things were in packages, but most of them were not. She gave me a lot of shirts and baseball caps. I was never one for hats, but she said she liked the way they looked on me, so I wore them. She told me she would get the clothes from the thrift store, or someone at her work gave them to her. Just stuff like that. I thought, again, it was normal. I didn't have a problem with thrift store stuff, other than the fact that sometimes it still kind of smelled like the last person, but that's why you're supposed to wash that stuff anyways, right? I think the weirdest gift she ever gave me was a pair of shoes that were too small for me. I told her I couldn't fit in them, but kept them anyways because I didn't want to seem ungrateful. She always seemed ecstatic when I would try on the stuff she got me, too. Like, she would practically squeal and pounce on me. I thought I should be happy to get the gifts, but I think she was actually more excited about it. Overall, though, the first few months were great until I started to learn about her tics that would set her off. One thing I did notice was that she started to become more jealous or territorial, I suppose. When we went to a restaurant or something, and the waitress would smile, call us honey, and make small talk, you know, her job, Olivia started to get mean. She would make faces at her, or even me at times. Again, not really experiencing something like this before, I just calmed her down. I told her the normal things, that all I needed was her in the sorts. It wasn't a lie. I wasn't the type to do that, but it wasn't a bad feeling either. Knowing that she was getting mad at the thought, you know? It was a kind of a nice ego boost. She was always so curious as to where I was going, what I was going to be doing for the day, which, again, I just took that as her being clingy. Since she was acting this way, I thought I would reciprocate by asking what her plans were for the day, and then she just snapped, saying that it was none of my business. I'd never seen this side of her, though, so I just apologized and did my best to comfort her. When she finally did calm down, she explained everything to me. Why she was so jealous, but also so defensive. She said it was because of her ex. She had been with this guy for a year, and apparently it was hell. He would be out all hours of the day and night, and would refuse to tell her where he was going, always making up lies or excuses. She said if she asked too many times, he would go into the rage and throw her to the ground and punch her till she passed out. She said she stayed with him, afraid he would hurt her if she tried to leave, though. Until one time, she finally found out that she was the side piece, basically, and this dude was engaged with a kid on the way. She was devastated, but it finally got her to pack up and leave while he wasn't home and she hasn't seen him since. All I could think to do was just comfort her and try my best to convince her that that wasn't me and I was not that type of person. So, with that in mind, I tried to be more accepting of her questioning and jealous comments, knowing what she had been through. Now, that part wasn't a lie. I did my best to be very open with her as to where I was going who I was going to be around, but I was also still very cautious as to where she would be on certain occasions. She would leave early in the mornings sometimes, as well as late at night, like when we were already in bed, and she always claimed it was for work. I didn't think much of it at the time, as some nurses are on call, right? That is a normal thing. But then I started thinking more into it. Like, would an intern nurse be on call, though? Or if she was, 
Would it really be all hours of the day? I just didn't know how to address it or question it due to her previous relationship. So I tried to just ask casually while we were eating or something if she was on call that night or something. I was pretending I wanted to make plans or do something together. There were a few occasions where she would tell me no, but then end up leaving anyways, saying she had to work. I still wasn't getting any answers. To jump a little ahead here, her disappearances continued to happen all while still trying to police me and my whereabouts. If this truly was her work, I tried to side with her and tell her that she should put her foot down to get a better schedule so that she could have a regular sleep pattern, hoping that would help ease her anyways with how controlling she had started to be. To my surprise, she agreed with me, and she said that she would ask them about it the next day. That blew up in my face when she came home upset, saying she had been fired. I consoled her trying to stay positive, and I offered to get dinner for her when her phone went off. Within seconds, her face perked up and she said she had to go. Obviously, she had just lost her job, so where could she need to be? I started to just outright ask when she told me she was going to go by her friend's place from work to get her stuff as she grabbed it for her. Sounded fairly reasonable, so I offered to go with her, but she was adamant that she could go alone. So I kissed her goodbye and waited to see her back after a while. A few hours passed when I started getting curious as to where she was, and if she was okay, since she was pretty upset. So, I tried texting her and didn't get an answer. I called her once, not wanting to trigger her or anything, when she answered, almost whispering. She said she was on her way back, and before I could even ask about her whispering, she hung up. Not long after, she showed up and pretty much slammed the door open, jolting me out of my chair. I was starting to doze off, so it took me a minute to realize that she was here, but instead of a box of what I would expect to be office supplies, she was holding a puppy. She also wasn't wearing the clothes that she left in. She was wearing a wedding dress. I approached her asking what the hell was going on when she started screaming at me that she didn't have time to walk me through it all and asked me to take her somewhere. And that's when I told her I wasn't going anywhere until she told me what was going on, but as I approached her, I realized the dress had something on it. And... It looked like blood. So that's when I stepped back, and again I asked her what the hell happened. She started freaking out, and started to head back out the door when shortly after, two or three police cars showed up at my house. We were told to get on the ground, handcuffed, everything, and all I could think to do was shout, What did you do? I had to give a whole statement to them as to what I was doing that night, how I knew her, and if I knew this other guy named Rick. And that's when it kind of all finally started to make sense. Olivia did not have a crazy, abusive ex-boyfriend. She was the crazy ex. And actually, not even that. This Rick guy had made out with her at a party... She became obsessed with him, but he was already seeing someone. Apparently, he tried telling her that it was all a mistake, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. She stalked him, harassed him, everything. Then, when she found out he was engaged, she started doing the same to his partner, but became threatening. She actually ran into his poor wife at the store once, and she attacked her. Punching her, scratching her, all of it. And that's when they filed the restraining order. However, someone had been breaking into their home and taking weird things, like clothing and shoes. She did work for the clinic, that part wasn't a lie, 
However, she was fired because she would randomly leave without warning to go and watch this guy when he went on lunch or went home. And when she got fired, she broke into their place one last time, stole this woman's wedding dress, and then tried to kill her. Rick ended up coming home and catching her, thankfully stopping her too, but she topped it all off by taking their dog as well. And her genius thought was that they didn't know where I lived, so she just went to my place. But the cops were definitely following her, already knowing about the restraining order and what she drove, I guess. I had to convince the police that I knew nothing about any of this, and I hoped it showed because I had to be a witness in court, and I heard most of it there. I tried speaking to her afterwards to try and see what the hell she was thinking, but as she explained her reasoning, all I could think was that she was absolutely delusional. Where was the person I had met like six months ago on that porch? So I definitely ended anything we had there. I was there for what they needed, gave the guy his stuff back, and we both apologized for what we had been through, and I moved on. I am still single, because that was just a mess, and I, I don't think I'm ready to try again, not just yet. Not to mention, I don't want to end up becoming just like Rick. I never really had the best of luck in relationships. I had a few, but none really lasted more than a year or so, but the breakups were never nightmares or anything. It was usually a mutual thing. I'll be the first to admit that I am not perfect. I'm not the type to cheat, and I'm not abusive, but I may not have been that attentive. But I did try. Because it is relevant to the story, I will also add that I wasn't the best kid growing up. I liked to skip classes, break into places, and get into fights with other people at school. It was always because of something stupid, like he was flirting with your girl, or he was talking crap on your little bro, or something similar to that. When I was on the verge of being expelled, my parents gave me a last chance by sending me to an alternative school for troubled kids. The thing is, I hated it there. I was miserable, but they also had mentors and guidance counselors that actually gave a damn about us, compared to the ones that were obligated to at the schools that I went to. Between actually being listened to, and being scared of that place, it actually set me straight. I graduated from there, severed contact with a lot of people that were a bad influence, and I really straightened up. Because of that... I would like to think that I became closer to my parents, too. Anyways, I always stayed close to home. I never moved out of state, barely left the city, and I had my own life. I knew how to have fun, but also control myself. Again, I had a few relationships here and there, but nothing too serious. Then, I met Shelby. Shelby was the sister of my friend's roommate. I went over to her place one time, and her roommate had just brought her sister over to stay for the weekend because her duplex was being bug-bombed. She was attractive, and I think she could tell that I was interested by the way she kept smiling and flirting immediately, too. It didn't take long for her to get my number, except I wasn't the one that gave it to her. She hinted and bugged my friend for it, so she finally gave it to her, saying she thought it was cute and funny. I was okay with it because my thought was, hey, at least she knows how to take initiative, right? We immediately started talking and snapping for hours throughout the day, even while at work. It wasn't maybe a few days in when she sent me a topless snap saying goodnight. Well, alright then. So, we started dating. 
I was over at my friend's a lot that week while she was there, and then I spent time at her place and mine. One good and bad thing about Shelby, though, was that she liked to party. So, we went to a lot of bars. Any party that she found out about, we were there. But she didn't just drink and have fun, she also liked to get high. Now, I did that in high school, but after finishing school, I quit and I hadn't touched it since. I felt a little uncomfortable being around it at first because I tried to avoid it, but there was just something about her that drew you in. She either made me comfortable enough to be there, or she just had a way to make me let my guard down. I'd be in the room with her while she got high, but I always turned the stuff down. One night, though, after having a rough day at work, she wore me down and finally convinced me to just take a puff, and I was out cold. Or at least I didn't remember much of the night afterwards. Sadly, it became a normal thing. We probably partied every weekend, and even a few times during the week. I know it was just pot, but I was always smoking when I was in school, and then having it again really took a toll on me and it started affecting everything else in my life, too. I started calling off stuff with my family and friends, I started having troubles at work with coming in late, and my productivity was slipping. Not to mention how I was mentally feeling like crap about myself and where I was headed. My brother confronted me about it, and we got into a pretty heated argument, but I knew that he was right. I needed to knock this crap off before it got worse. So, I tried discussing it with Shelby, telling her I needed to get sober again for my health, and I tried to suggest that we should do it together. I thought I really had feelings for her at the time, so I thought I could help us both out. She did not see it that way. She berated me. She made fun of me, said I was pathetic and that I just needed to grow up, and then she left. I had never seen that side of her, outside the bar fights I would occasionally have to pull her out of. I spent the day by myself, thinking over stuff when she finally called and apologized and then came over. Except she acted like the conversation had never happened. She brought more beer and just wanted to do more of the same. This back and forth continued for about two months or so, and I felt like crap. I hated where I was going, I hated how I was feeling, and I hated that I didn't know what to do about Shelby. Unfortunately, it wouldn't change until I lost my job. I was late one too many times, and I was let go. I came home, and Shelby was there and I told her what happened and that it was a wake-up call that I needed to fix myself, with or without her. It became a huge fight. She actually smacked me and scratched me multiple times, to the point that I stood with the door open yelling at her to get out as she continued to hit me. I refused to hit her or even grab her in fear of what she might do, so that's all I could think to do. Apparently, someone else had called the cops, though, and they finally had her escorted out. For days, she tried calling and texting me, telling me to take her back and talk to her. She had left a few things at my house, and I packed them up, put them in a bag at my front door, and told her to come get them. She sat there banging on my door for almost an hour, until someone else came out and told her to leave. She continued to call and text me, between pleading and threatening that I would regret this, and then I just stopped hearing from her for about a week. I thought she had finally moved on. Not at all. I tried to hang out with my friends to keep me occupied, but they were ignoring my calls, or giving me lame excuses as to why they couldn't, and I didn't understand why. This only caused me to feel worse and become more reclusive and depressed. My parents even called me one afternoon and offered to have me over for dinner that night, and I was actually excited because I was being invited somewhere. 
However, my stomach just sank when I walked in and saw Shelby. She had a black eye, bruises down her arm, and she looked like she'd been crying. The problem, though, was that my parents and my brother were there, looking at me like they were heartbroken. Shelby had told my family that I got her into drugs, and that she was pregnant and I was beating on her to get her to lose the baby. My own parents believed that crazy woman over me, and they threatened to call the cops or for me to go to rehab. I tried to reason with them, ask her when she found out she was pregnant, show proof, anything, but she just cried and hid behind my mom. I was seething. But of course, nothing I said they believed. With no other option, I just left. I called my friend, Lynn, who was the roommate of Shelby's sister because we'd been friends for years in hopes that she would listen to me, but she told me that Shelby had gone over there saying the same thing. Thankfully, Lynn was hesitant to believe her. She knew I was a troubled kid, but she also knew that I was not like that anymore, and I was never abusive or aggressive. She started asking her all these questions to which she would give vague responses or say she didn't remember, but apparently she was growing suspicious, and Shelby said she needed to rest and retreated to her sister's room. Finally, someone was on my side and believed me. I just had to figure out how to change my parents' mind. Lynn knew my parents and how strict they were with me, so she tried calling them and asking what was going on too, but they were still hesitant to believe her because they claimed they knew their own kid. So, I had to try to fix it myself. Thankfully, I live in a state where one party consents to record someone was legal, so I called her and invited her over so we could work things out. She came over, and she acted like the past few weeks had never even happened. She hugged and kissed me, said she knew I would come around eventually, and I gritted my teeth while we had dinner. That's when I started asking the questions. I played along like I loved her, and really wanted to be back with her and asked her about the bruises. She said she hit herself in the face with the bottle repeatedly until she gave herself a black eye, and then purposely started a bar fight, knowing that they would cause her injuries. So... I fed into her ego trip and told her how she really got me with the pregnancy, too. She actually laughed and said she was worried my parents were going to ask for proof because then she would have to find someone to take a test for her. So, I asked her, acting confused then that she wasn't pregnant and she admitted that she wasn't. Finally, I snuck away to the bathroom, called the cops because I knew she was going to lose it, and marched back into my living room with newfound confidence, telling her to leave. As expected, she went off. She said I just used her, and that she was going to tell everyone that I raped her, and that she started smacking me and yelling. Thankfully, the police showed up while she was on top of me, hitting me, and grabbed her immediately. You can bet your ass I pressed charges and a restraining order and I never saw her again. It took a while for my parents to finally talk to me, and even longer for them to apologize for not trusting me, but we are better now. That was over a decade ago. I'm actually happily married now, and I have been sober ever since. I don't even drink because that gives me nightmares. I will say, I have gotten some friend requests on Facebook from her, though. Typically, it's like once or twice a year, and She's making a new account each time because I block them all. Even better, according to her profile, she's married with a child. Nope, I'm good, Shelby. I never, ever want to meet or see you again. Back in high school... I was in a pretty serious relationship. At least, it was serious for us. Alex and I were really good friends in middle school, until it slipped out that he had feelings for me. 
I knew him really well, and I knew he was a sweet guy, so I was willing to give it a try, and we were inseparable. We ended up dating from our freshman year through the summer to our senior year. Unfortunately, I found out that summer before my senior year that we would be moving out of the country due to my father's work. I was devastated. I would have to leave my whole life behind that I knew. I remember there was a huge fight between my parents for like a week because my mom wanted to stay so that I could finish school here first and then I could choose what I wanted to do afterwards. My dad was adamant, though, that we didn't have a choice and he refused the idea of me living with my aunt to finish. We were all going to be moving to the UK and we didn't have a choice. I almost thought they were going to get a divorce, but my mom eventually came around to it and tried her best to convince me as well. The problem, however, was me being a teenage girl in love. I thought this was going to be the end for me. There was no way we were going to be able to make a long-distance relationship work, especially not across countries. So I went over to Alex's house one night to hang out and break the news. It was incredibly difficult for both of us. He tried everything he could to be optimistic, too. Tried convincing me it would work out between us, and that he could come visit after we graduated. I remember losing it, telling him that it wouldn't work out, saying it was over, and then I left. He tried calling me a few times to talk, but... I didn't really want to talk because I knew it was just going to make it worse. I spent the summer packing, I had a sleepover with my closest friends one last time, and then we left the States. My dad was actually from the UK, so we already had passports and dual citizenship since I was a baby, so thankfully that didn't add to the time. We got there and I became a recluse for a while. I had to start over on friendships, and it really hit hard for the first half of the year. I had a few really close friends keep in touch with me via email, and the occasional and limited long-distance calls. Alex tried to do the same, but it was really hard for me. I ignored him for a while, and finally started responding and then talking to him. He was still such an understanding and caring guy through it all. He didn't make me feel bad. He didn't push it and try to make it work. Just asked me what it was like. How I was feeling about it all. Things like that. And honestly, it helped a lot. To just have someone to vent to and explain my day-to-day -day was great. My parents approved of him too, so they allowed me to use a webcam to talk to him while in the living room or kitchen, still, which was amazing. As time went on, I made more friends near me, and it made it so much easier having connections on both sides. However, as I met more friends and spent more time with them, I started talking to my old friends less and less. It was never a sour situation, though. As time moved on, we still talked, and on MySpace and Facebook... But we had our own lives, and that also included Alex. Our calls became less frequent, and the messages became shorter and had less substance to them. Eventually, I got a long email from Alex basically saying that he still cared for me and was happy I was doing well, but that he met someone and was starting to have feelings for them. He was basically asking for my permission to ask them out. I was happy for him. I was glad he was able to move on, and I told him to go for it. From then, he confirmed they were dating, and from there, our emails were almost non-existent. But we did keep in contact on social media. It definitely got easier over time living there. As expected, we ended up staying there longer than just that year. I went to college there, and had a great time, but... I also knew where I belonged. 
I knew that I would eventually move back to Oregon, because that was my home, and it always would be. So, after about five years, I moved back to the States, alone, while my parents stayed in the UK. I was about two cities over from where I used to live, so still fairly close, and I found a great job in my field before I even moved. I hadn't really had any long-lasting relationships while in the UK, so I didn't feel like I was leaving much behind. I got an apartment and a cat, and I was content with my life. I reconnected with two of my closest girlfriends, and we had a lot of catching up, but otherwise, it was life as usual. To be honest, I didn't even think about reaching out to Alex because I knew we both moved on so long ago, and it didn't even cross my mind. Apparently, though, he caught wind that I was back and wanted to get in touch. He reached out to me on Facebook, and I was surprised, but was also happy to hear from him. We caught up a little bit, I gave him my phone number, and we probably talked on the phone one night for an hour or so. We decided we would get together for dinner one night and just hang out. A few days later, we met up and had a great night. We started talking about the rest of high school, what we did afterwards, and even relationships. He told me that he'd had a few, but none of them ever lasted or worked out, and he said that he was single at the time. After several drinks and talking, we went back to my place and hooked up. But I knew then that I wanted to be with him, and I had control of my life, so I could make that decision. We started seeing each other more and more, and I told my friends about it too. One of them was surprised because they said he wasn't the same after I left. They said he became very depressed and quiet compared to who he used to be, as well as aggressive. He was disrespectful to the teachers and mean to our mutual friends until they stopped hanging out with him. I tried convincing her that it was probably just as hard for him as it was for me, but that he seemed like the same person that I had to leave behind. That's when she told me about him changing schools. She said he started practically stalking a girl he was dating and broke up with, and it became a problem with the school, so his parents had to pull him out. I wasn't aware of any of this, and I convinced myself that it was probably difficult for him, and that it was high school, so we were adults now, and we were all different people. The next time we got together, I was curious, so... I brought it up to him, and I definitely saw a change in him when I did, too. He explained it exactly as I expected, though. He said it was really hard on him. He tried to move on, but it was so difficult, so the girl had broken up with him, and it was like losing me all over again. He admitted that what he did was stupid and embarrassing, and he had tried to forget about it, but people kept bringing it up and treating him differently because of it. I know, it was me falling for my old high school sweetheart, but it just made me feel even worse for him, and kind of like I was to blame. I told him I understood, and I didn't think any less of him because of it either, so we went on as normal. Now, I didn't really think about it at the time, but when we were together, we would either be in public, or the majority of the time was at my place. He very seldom stayed overnight, though, but I didn't think much of it other than probably not wanting to move too fast. At one point, though, he told me he was going to have to go out of town for work, and would be gone for three days. I was really grateful for the job that I had, and was able to work remotely, and I offered to go with him. However, he was quite adamant that I couldn't go, and he said he would keep in touch the whole way, so I accepted, and just waited for his call when he arrived where he was going. He called me a few hours later that night, saying he had made it, and that he had a convention the next day and would call me that evening. The day went by as normal. 
He called me shortly after dinner and that was it. I went about my night and then I went to bed. In the middle of the night though, Alex called me and he sounded rushed or distracted. I asked him what was wrong and he said there wasn't anything wrong. In fact, the convention had been cancelled, so he was coming home, and almost was, and he asked to come stay at my place tonight. Half awake and confused, I agreed. He was there pretty quick. He was a few hours away, so I was confused how he got to my place so quickly, but he claimed he was trying to surprise me. When he got there, though, he was wet, like he had just taken a shower or had been sweating, but... I didn't really have time to think about it or ask questions before we were both preoccupied. The next few days were great, though. He seemed happier than normal. He was getting up and making breakfast, helping with dinner, and he even stayed the weekend at my place. On top of all this, Alex actually asked me to marry him and suggested that we moved back to the UK to be close to my parents. I was ecstatic, but... I was also confused as to why he would want to move to the UK. I waited so long to move back, and I was lucky to reconnect with him, and now he wanted to move with me. I told him yes on the marriage, but said that we needed to talk about moving. He seemed a little disappointed, but was giving different options, like other states or countries, but eventually I convinced him to give me some time. Sadly... It wouldn't last long, though. I started getting calls from my friends back-to-back -back and texts asking to call her, so I called her back. She was frantic, asking if I was with Alex, to which I said I was, but she said she needed to talk to me alone. This was the same friend that told me about Alex's past, and I didn't want him to get upset, so I went back to my office to talk to her. She started asking me all about where he had been, what he was doing, things like that. I got her to calm down enough to explain a little more. She told me to meet her somewhere and to not tell him. So I told him I had to make a run for something and he started becoming anxious. He was asking me specifically where I was going, what I was going to be doing, how long I was going to be gone and things like that. While arguing with him about this, and trying to figure out what the hell was going on between him and my friend, I got a knock at my door. It was the cops. When I answered, they had their hands on their gun and immediately asked if Alex was there. Before I could answer, he nearly shoved me away from the door and put his hands up for the cops. At that point, I was scared, confused, crying, wanting answers. Alex was handcuffed and shouting that he still loved me and that it was an accident. Shortly after all this, and trying to get answers from the police, my friend showed up. Between the vague info the cops gave me, and the news article my friend showed me, I figured it all out. Turned out, Alex was not single when we had first started dating. He was married. He never had a ring on any time we were together. I guess that also explained why he never stayed over and that it was usually on the evenings that we saw each other. However, that wasn't the worst part. The weekend he said he was going out of town, he was supposed to be going with his wife, but instead of breaking it off with me, or potentially divorcing his wife, he killed her. He smothered her or strangled her and, based on the time frames, called me shortly afterwards, and that's when he showed up at my place. I was horrified, scared, and heartbroken. Here, I thought I was rekindling a love I remembered when I had just slept with a killer, and he was trying to flee the country and frame it as him being romantic. Apparently, it was taking a while for me to talk him into letting me go to my friends that night, so my friend called the cops, since she knew he was there with me, 
fearing that he may try something. I'm still not sure if he would have ever done anything to me, as he set it up like he was doing it for me, which made me feel even crappier. Someone had just lost their life because of me, and I've never been the same. He was sentenced to life with no parole, but he still tries to send me letters. So there's my crazy and sad ex story. <laughs> no matter how much you think you're in love, you should trust your friends. Sometimes they know and see more things that you may be blind to. So that was a collection of creepy ex-lover stories. Some horrifying, horrifying stories. Absolutely downright terrifying. Very sorry to anyone who has to go through any situation like this, and also a huge thank you to everyone who sends stories my way or lets me use their stories. Just know I really do appreciate it, and hopefully these stories can educate as much as they can entertain. So yeah, if you enjoyed this video, please do consider hitting that thumbs up button and subscribing if you're new to the channel. If you're not new to the channel, welcome back. Always appreciate a repeat customer. And if you want to support further, and tell me that you think I should keep doing this forever, hit join down below, or go to my Patreon page, which is linked down in the description, where for $1 a month you can get that early access stuff that I always brag about. Yeah. Good stuff. Anyways, I hope you're all having a gorgeous day, and I hope I'll see you on the next video, but until then, sleep well.